Once we finished recording Creatures, I spent much of the rest of the year going back and forth between L.A. and New York to see Donna. She came to New York a lot, too, and lived out of my apartment. After her TV show Bosom Buddies got canceled, she auditioned for a movie called Dr. Detroit. She told me after the audition that she thought that Dan Aykroyd, the star of the film, was a genius. I thought that assessment was a stretch. Donna was looking for a new financial advisor, so I introduced her to Howard Marks. Howard had a pot belly and always wore his pants below his stomach, using suspenders to hold up his trousers. Not uncharacteristically, the day we went to see him, he'd probably had a few stiff drinks beforehand. He was eating his lunch at his desk when we arrived. He gave Donna a big talk about saving for the future and how important financial planning was, and after this long dissertation, he stood up and started to walk over to a side table in the corner of his office with the remains of his lunch and his dirty napkins on a lunch tray. As he got up, it was as if it was happening in slow motion. I could see his suspenders dangling down. He must have taken them off his shoulders while sitting at his desk. As he started to cross the room, his pants began to shimmy downward until they dropped to the floor. Howard looked down, threw his tray in the air, reached for his pants and screeched, Oh my God! Is this normal? Donna asked me. She landed the role in Dr. Detroit, and I visited her on the set in Chicago and gave her a diamond ring. I didn't call it an engagement ring. The relationship was stagnating somewhat. Something was lacking for both of us, but I didn't want to lose her, and I didn't want to be left. Sometimes Donna would drop out of sight, and I wouldn't hear from her for a few days. She was living out of my place when she was in New York, and just before Christmas, I found a new fur coat in the closet. She said she'd taken it from the wardrobe department of something she was working on. It wasn't too long before she blindsided me by suddenly talking about having never been on her own and needing space. I told her that I didn't want to be just another guy dating her and didn't want to share her. Although there were more unanswered questions now and more distance between us, we dropped the subject and didn't bring it up again for a while. Then I saw among her things a little t-shirt with Martha's Vineyard on the front of it. Martha's Vineyard? When had she gone to Martha's Vineyard? She would explain her disappearances away, kind of. I didn't ask too many questions either because I wasn't sure I wanted to know the truth. And anyway, when someone was inconsiderate or dishonest, it reinforced what I thought of myself. This is what I deserve. If only I can get her to like me. A few months after my all-or-nothing ultimatum to Donna, I decided it was just too hard. Nothing and no one had filled the void. Anything I got from her was better than nothing. I took a deep breath and called her. She seemed stunned. I told her how I felt, and we started speaking frequently on the phone again. Talk of missing each other wasn't uncommon. We even got together when Kiss played a show in L.A. One morning, just before we left for South America for the last leg of the tour, I glanced at a copy of the newspaper, and a small article caught my eye. The actress Donna Dixon has married her Dr. Detroit co-star Dan Aykroyd, newly discovered paperwork shows. The marriage license came to light in Martha's Vineyard. What? Martha's Vineyard? It turned out they had already been married for three months. I was stunned to realize that during the time that we had been talking again, she had been on the verge of getting married and then, in fact, had gotten married. Suddenly, I felt like I was underwater. I could barely move. I called her. You were married when we were talking? She said something about how she hoped I would find what she had found. No explanation, no apology. I hung up.